it's just not normal to to basically capitalistically approach your identity as a marketing business and that's what we're targeting is the way in which they market themselves as native and they mark and they and they capitalize on our trauma right to build their careers and their influence and then and then the people who allege to protect you are complicit in the corruption yeah, they're not doing anything. Yeah, we they and they act like it's it's too complicated. You know, native identity is too complicated is their whole answer. But I mean, you know, fraud is not complicated. Do you know what I mean? They're trying to say, oh, blood quantum's evil and bad. We're not gonna look at blood quantum. Well, these people have no blood to measure. There's blood quantum's not their issue. I am incredibly excited to have Jacqueline Keeler here, who is gonna tell us something that is utterly insane and completely mind-blowing and absolutely true. So before we begin, Jacqueline, tell us a little bit about who you are. Yeah, hi, I'm Peter, nice to meet you. And um, I'm a journalist and author. I live here in Portland, Oregon. And um, I'm the author of the most recent book, The Camp Was Standoff, which compares the, uh, you know, the takeover of the Malheur Wildlife Refuge here in Oregon to, uh, by the Bundys uh, to Standing Rock, um, the No Dapple protest. And, um, and I'm a citizen of the Navajo Nation, uh, which is located in the Southwest and is the size of Ireland and has the population of Iceland, is larger than 18 member states in the UN. And so uh, it's a country within the United States. And then I am also, my father's Yankton Sioux, which uh, he is Dakota um, from South Dakota. Okay. And um, so that's where I'm coming from. Okay. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you some questions. Mm -hmm. But before we begin, this interview is about, as insane as this may sound to everybody, this is about people who pretend to be Native American and achieve, get jobs, get positions, get tenure, and then once they're exposed, literally nothing happens to them. So that's what we're going to talk about. But before we talk about that, what qualifies you to have this conversation? What qualifies me? Yeah. Um, I guess I just, uh, I'm a journalist and I, I verify facts and I don't, I, I think that... In journalism, you know, it's not like writing a Facebook post. Do you mean you, things are fact checked? You know, so like I remember when I wrote a piece for The Nation in 2014 and I was talk, writing about Clive and Bundy and his claims to the land. And um, and I mentioned as part of my piece that uh, um, the Benjamin Franklin spoke Mohawk, which I'd heard from Mohawk people. But the editors, the fact checkers, wouldn't allow that paragraph to remain because we couldn't find any... We couldn't verify that. Oh, okay. So you just eliminate it. If you can't verify something, you just okay. take that paragraph out. So, so so you're a fan of evidence. Yes. I'm a fan of evidence, too. Yeah. We're both fans of evidence. Yes. We both like evidence. Okay, that's pretty good. So that's the commonality we have there. Okay, so what is your... So you have your Native American by blood. Yeah. Now, let's say that I wanted to figure out who's Native American. Like, how would I go about doing that? Yeah, you know, it's so funny because... Growing up, I never thought that it would ever be a question about whether someone was Native American because, you know, all four of my grandparents were enrolled in federally recognized tribes. All eight of my great grandparents were also enrolled in federally recognized tribes, which means that they are all subject to Indian federal law and policy. And so, so often when you see pretendians, they are, they're pretendians. they're capitalizing on the trauma. So pretendians are people who yeah. falsely claim to be native for their careers. Okay. So these aren't people who are privately reconnecting or seeking a private. These are people who have sometimes built their career for decades. And um, so, you know, I think in October I did a piece for the San Francisco Chronicle, uh, where basically, um, you know, I revealed that Sashin Littlefeather was not. Um, she claimed to be, that, yeah, White one. Mountain Apache yeah. and Yaki later. And, um, and so, you know, I, I was contacted by her sisters and we'd already done her tree and her and everything. So we, uh, so yeah, so we, we, we presented the evidence which showed that her family had no ties whatsoever to the okay. White Mountain Okay. Okay. So let's, so let, let, let's slow it down here. So just, I just want to make sure I'm absolutely clear. Cause I know some people are going to be watching this and they're going to be like, that's just, that's just too crazy. There's just, that could not possibly be true because that's what, when I started thinking, I'm like, it's like, it's just, this is just too insane. Okay. Yeah. So there are people 
who are pretending to be Indians, and they're are they called pretendians? So, so the term pretendian is a term that um, I sort of purposed, repurposed um, for um, a specific type, which is where they're monetarily uh, for their careers, like they're putting it on their resume, right? And um, and so. You know, so they, they're really capitalizing on it, right? Okay, so they're, they're mark- pretending to be Indian. Yeah. And so, yeah, so it's, I, I call a wannabe someone who's doing it privately, right? But a pretending is someone who's doing it professionally. Okay. Yeah. So let, let's say that, that Travis over there tells me he's a member of some, the Sioux, I don't know, a tribe, whatever, yeah. whatever. How do we go about, how do we go about figuring out if Travis is bullshitting us or not? So one of the things we do is we, so, so um, a couple of years ago, I started this list called the alleged pretendian list, right? Which um, basically uh, this was started after uh, in um, December, 2019, I think it was, uh, you know, Biden had nominated Deb Holland, Congresswoman Deb Holland to be interior secretary. And this was really momentous. She's a, um, she's a native woman, a member of the Laguna Pueblo tribe in New Mexico. And, and so this was the first time that a Native woman would be overseeing this much of the land base in, in the United States. And so uh, so what does the New York Times do? Well, they get an op-ed written by what they think is a Native woman, but who actually is a white woman pretending to be Native. And and she's outed by her stepdaughter because she had, she was using her late husband's tribal, um, tribal identity and uh, falsely claiming she's a white woman and her article is actually talking down to Deb Holland, native woman and native woman telling her how she should do her job. Okay. So that's, and so that's what really okay. started it. And so, so I started the list in order, so I, you know, I've been hearing about pretendians while I was doing my regular job as a journalist. You know, I'd contact native um, professors or, you know, just people that I wanted to get a quote from, native leaders, and they would tell me about pretendians. Like, this person's a pretendian, this person is. We, we outed this person in court. Do you know what I mean? And stuff. And so, you know, like I remember um, talking to Suzanne Harjo, a very well-known tribal leader, national leader um, on the issue of mascots. And I, and she was like, oh, yeah, you know, uh, Roxanne dunbar Ortiz, you know, she has the best-selling book in Native Studies, right? Um, Indigenous People's History of the United States. Wow. And it's a take on Howard Zinn's, uh, yeah, 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 People's History of the United States. And, um, and she is a pretendian. She claims to be um, Cheyenne and Cherokee. And so in the 70s, Suzanne Harder, who is legitimately Cheyenne, when outed her as a fake Cheyenne in the 70s. And, and then again in the 80s, another very well-known national leader, uh, Hank Adams, who 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 was in the Fishins here in Washington State, um, he's Lakota though, but he outed her in Aquasasti Notes, like the preeminent Native um, okay. news outlet. And then she was outed again in the '90s in Indian Country Today. So yet she's still publishing okay. the most popular. Like, book. Let's let's like yeah. let's let's select. so Travis is telling me he's Native American, yeah. and I'm saying to you. Travis is saying he's Native American. How can we figure that out? So, well, the first thing we do is we look at what he's claiming. So what we verify are their stated claims. So we're not verifying they're tribally enrolled unless they claim to be tribally enrolled okay. or a certain blood quantum. So what we look at is then we, we determine who is his family, like who are his parents and who are his grandparents. Okay. And we look, we build out the tree from there and we look at the lives of all the people in the tree. What if he says, I don't know who my grandparents were. It's just, I was told I was, you know... Uh, I don't know. It actually, tribe from it, tribe it's, X. It's, it's not hard to figure out people's grandparents. I mean, unless someone is adopted, and, and out of the two hundred we have on our addressing our, our ledger pretendians list, only um, three were adopted. So, um, so it's a very small percentage. The fact is that you can build out people's trees. You, you, it's okay. easy to figure out who their okay. So let's are. say that you got you have one of tra- Travis's grandparents. Yeah. What do you do with that? Or well, we, we first of all we look at. First, we, we, we try to build the tree out. So we look at how have they been identifying and if any native um, people pop up in the tree. And so as we're building, we're, we're using primary documentation from their lives, whether it's their birth certificates, their census stuff, you know, um, how they got their land. You know, if, if, if they are uh, white people moving to Georgia, the way they'll get land through the Georgia land lottery, which was only open to white people. It wasn't open to Cherokees. And so there's all kinds of ways in which, and, and usually you can, 
if you're Indian, it pops up right away. Like if your grandparents or your great grandparents are Indian, it takes us. Pop, pop, where does it pop up? Well, the documentation pops up right away. I mean, and the, you find because I know that people are going to be watching this. And some of these pretend Indians are going to be watching this, and they're going to be thinking to themselves, "She's not going to debunk me." Oh, it's so easy. No, no, no. It, it's you know really the documentation. You can tell if the family's white because not one of the things that pretendians like to say is, "Oh, my ancestor was a better Indian than you because they hit out as a white person and refused to sign any documentation proving they were Indian." Right, as a way to kind of give it to the man, right? And your grandparents were sellouts and collaborators, and that's why you're documented as Indians. Like they, they call us paper Indians, they call us treaty Indians, and these are derogatory terms. Um, it doesn't make any sense really because, you know, my Navajo grandparents didn't speak English. Uh, they only spoke Navajo and they were traditional Navajos. How are they going to go move into a white community, hide out as white people just to give it to the man? Do you know what I mean? It's just a completely ridiculous proposition, but in academia, they buy it. Okay. And so what, what we do is we go back to the ancestor that usually that they're claiming is hiding out as a white person. <laughs> we build out that person's family tree. So like you know, a person <laughs> so doesn't, crazy. a person doesn't exist in a vacuum. You know, they have right, parents, right. they have grandparents, they have brothers, they have sisters, they have cousins, they have nieces and nephews. Not all those people are going to hide out as white people. Some of them are going to go on the trail of tears. Do you know what I mean? Right. And when I, right, when right, I was right. covering the first example, I, the first story I did on pretendianism was in 2015. Um, I did an um, article. God, it's for, a whole ism. I, I, I did an article in 2015 for the Daily Beast and for Indian Country mm -hmm. Today on uh, my, my I, I went to Dartmouth College and my, uh, my alma mater hired a pretendian to run the Native American program, which is a retention program to keep. Is, is that where they go? Is that where a lot of these people go? They they go into academia. Yes, that's, academia is basically a pretendian factory, you know. And so, um, so people like they begin by box checking, and then they race shift more. And um, so they, uh, in this case, she was claiming her well, her grandfather had started his own tribe in the seventies, right? And then this tribe later fell into trouble because they were all the leaders were convicted of molesting thirteen year old girls in uh, Lenape sex magic sweat lodges in Ohio. In and the these 90s. are all white people. Yes, they're all pretending to be Indian. So she inherited his tribe, which was a nonprofit, a and, tribe of pedophiles. Yes, and claiming to be Lenape Wonderful. in Pennsylvania. Mm. And of course, the the Lenape, also known as the Delaware Indians, they were removed from Pennsylvania around eighteen thirty, and they were moved to Indian Territory, Oklahoma, and also. So some of them went to Wisconsin. Okay. And so there are two federally recognized Delaware tribes in, in Oklahoma. Okay. And so, but because they've been gone so long, in the 1970s, all these pretendians popped up. And there are all these white people living in Pennsylvania who claim that they hid out for a hundred and some fifty years as white people. <laughs> and so, but the thing is, like, uh, there's a blog called the Fake Indian Blog. And they did her. They did her tree, and they found out that her grandfather's family came from Ireland in 1902. Like they weren't even around when the Lenape were removed from Pennsylvania. Okay. And so they were still in the old world. So when she was confronted with this, you know what she said? No. She said, "Well, my Indian ancestors stole the identity of that Irish family." Yeah, they never admit. They never admit that they're lying. And so yeah, so she is still at Dartmouth. She's no longer the Native Americans. Okay. Program. She's a dean now, a freshman. Okay, this is so crazy. Yeah. I mean, this is this is truly. Listen, I know you don't know me, but I traffic in crazy, hmm. and this is another level of crazy. So let me make sure I got this right. A couple of questions first. So these people exclusively white or primarily white or white? So on our list, primarily white, just because they're more successful at it. Do you know what I mean? And so, um, but there are people of all races. We have, of course, in Hollywood, a lot of them are Eurasian, people who have one white American parent and one Asian parent, and they claim through the white parent they're part Indian, uh, but they use their Eurasian looks to get Native roles. Um, in, um, you know, there are, of course, you know, a lot of and just all races. Yeah. So, so, so one of the commonalities is the reason people do this is to get advantages perceived or probably real that claiming to be Native American brings. Yeah, they're more successful. I think um, one of the reasons I think pretendians are more successful is when they don't carry the trauma, right? They're, they're trafficking in trauma, trauma that they, their families have never experienced, right? 
And, um, and then they, um, and, and it's a form of escapism for them. It's not their real identity. So they can spend a lot of time on it, embellishing it. Okay. So we've now established, and if, if I get this wrong, cause I'm new to this. So please let me know what I've learned is you have a lot of people pretending to be Indians. We're going to call them pretendians, at least 200 that we know of. We have 200. We have many more that we've been asked Suspect. to investigate. We we froze the list of 200. Okay. Yeah. Um, would it be fair to say most? In other words, 51% or more of these people are in academia. Would that be fair? I would or say a lot. so. Would well, you say a lot? So, so the list we have is not. It is not um, a randomized list. It's 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 a selected list. So okay. a lot of people who who participate in putting the list together were were professors, were were academics. So they are a lot of academics in there, but there are a lot of other folks um, in other fields as well. And of course, there's crossover because a lot of authors are also professors. Okay. And things like that. So yeah. So a lot of. People and a, a lot of these pretendians go into academia, and we know. And you're telling me, so I'm just taking your word for it because I know nothing about it. You're telling me we know for a fact we can tell these people are pretending. Like there's just no, yeah. Like we I can think, just look at the historical register. Yes, the re the records. So you know, I did bring my laptop if you want to look at no, like what no, a no, tree no. looks like. But yeah, basically, when you go through someone's family tree, right? We're, we're very cautious. You know, we um, if you want to see kind of what I did, you can see my sub stack. I did a whole 44-page report on Sashim Littlefeather's family, right, uh, as one example. So it's definitive. It's just, yeah, I mean. Overwhelming. You, you know, if someone is native, um, you know, their family have experienced that within living memory. So you, you'll find them living on a reservation. You'll find them documenting as native people. And often they'll say, well, you know, we, you know, if we're, you know, the adoption issue, but you know, the ones that we're looking at only, like I said, only three out of 200, that's 1.5% were adoptees. Um, one of them we were able to prove was not native because the adoption industry is, is not very accurate in the way it portrays the children it sells. But um, yeah, the um, so I think the main, what we found when we did this 200 is we found that 97% um, of them, we could not verify their claims. So, so let me ask you a question. What if somebody who's watching this is a pretend Indian says, uh, well, uh, what about a, a DNA test, 23andMe? What yeah, about that? Yeah, so DNA is, um, so, you know, I, I am, um, I'm 1 16th French, right? My grandmother's grandfather came from France near the Swiss border um, in 1855 and came to the United States and married into, uh, you know, he married um, Sitting Bull's niece, right? And, um, and so, you know, but I don't have French citizenship. Do you mean? I'm not a French person. I don't market myself as a French writer. You know, he, he was a French Protestant. I don't market myself as a French Huguenot. Do you know what I mean? Um, there's a point at which, you know, we are citizens of nations. We're political. We're not racial. We're, I mean, a native citizen of a, tr a native nation can be of any perceived race. Two people can look identical and one can have legitimate native, you know, political and ancestry. Others not. Um, the problem with DNA is that one, tribes don't participate in those DNA databases. They they boycott them because of the issue of our DNA being so rare, it's viewed as a sort of commodity over which we have very little control. I wrote a piece about this um, in Motherboard Vice News on the um, National Institutes of Health attempt to try to circumvent tribes, tribal authority, and to gain access to our DNA. And so, yeah, so we don't, we don't participate. So the, the DNA database they have has, is not from native people here in the U.S. So, it's from other parts of the hemisphere. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. And, and also it's not, you can't, there, there's not enough DNA to tell what tribe you are. So it's complete. The only way tribes use DNA is for paternity testing. What, what, so what about you, Elizabeth Warren? What, what, yeah. What? So her, you know, the, her tiny amount, you know, um, that's within the realm of error, Right. And also, um, we there's also the problem where you may actually be uh, sharing DNA with other people who think they're native, right? Because some of this DNA, this DNA is self-reported, right? So someone thinks they're Indian, and so then you're matching yourself to their DNA. Well, what if they're a white person? You're just matching yourself to another white. It's not very scientific. And in that particular da DNA database she was looking at, all of that native DNA came from Central and South America, so, not from the United States. So just, just to be clear, and then I want to bring it back. So Elizabeth Warren, would you consider her to be a Native American? No. 
No, she has no, you know, um, we looked at her tree. I wrote about her use of DNA in NBC News. I wrote a piece about why what, why what she did was so harmful to tribal sovereignty. Yeah, because yeah, we yeah. are sovereign nations. We're nationalities. We're not, you know, little bits of DNA. I mean, if someone were to find out they had a little bit of Europe, you know, European DNA, does that mean that they have a right to declare themselves a German citizen? But and they don't even know what European tribe. if I'm wrong, but European. didn't she get, she received yeah. some financial benefit from, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not an I expert I don't know about that, really. I do know that um, the only thing I really know of is that uh, – is that when she was um, at Harvard as a law professor, when uh, folks were protesting the lack of a woman of color in the law school uh, in the 90s, <laughs> Harvard trumped out her name as evidence that they did have. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh yeah. So um, so that's so that so she was used in that way by the uh, by well, the university. She was used. But yeah, well, yeah I guess yeah. she was. In a I mean, sense, so that but... Harvard could kind of like not have to yeah. do anything. OK. You know? OK. So. so this this is. Okay, so up to now, this is just, you know, low-scale crazy to me. Mm -hmm. But let me tell you why you're sitting in that chair, which is completely insane to me. What is mind-blowingly crazy, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, so I'm going to tell you my perception of this, and you tell me if this is accurate, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. When these institutions, particularly academic institutions, find out that there are people on staff, usually but not always in Native American departments, they do nothing. Yeah. Now, is, is that accurate? That's accurate. That's absolutely accurate. I mean, uh, so the New York Times did a piece. Uh, you know, the, of course, they published a pretendian, which then drove me to create the a pretendian list. But the uh, but they, they revealed a pretendian um, a few years ago, uh, Andrea Smith. And she was the sort of poster girl for... Um, for uh, native feminism around 2005, that era. And so she, um, and she claimed to be Cherokee. And, um, but uh, I had already known she was a pretendian. She was on our list. I had spoken to David Cornsilk, who was the, he's the premier Cherokee genealogist. And let me just, let me yeah. just s slow you down a little bit because there's a lot of stuff here. And, and she was with what institution? Um, the University of California, Riverside. Okay, so she's with University of Cal California, Riverside. Yeah. We know that she's a pretend Indian. Yeah. We know that there's, there's the no... The New York Times outed her. Yeah. The New York Times outed her. Was she removed from her position? No. She's still head of the Native Studies Department there. Okay. I just... Okay. I'm just having trouble with that. Yeah. I'm, I'm just... Aren't these the very same institutions that are gung-ho on land acknowledgements and Native Studies and yep. vulnerable people? And w w please help me. What am I missing? So, So when I... So, so with, you know, um, with uh, Andrea Smith, I was actually contacted by some of her Native students while they were in class because they were just so – it was so hard for them to sit through the class and have sure. to, you know, kowtow to Fake. her. Th yeah. They have to – they have to – yeah. To get the grade. Yeah. yeah they, they, have. They, they would have to pretend – yeah. In front of a pretendia. There's like layers of pretending. Yes, it, it's a form of abuse of the students, you know. And um, but uh, when I first covered the story with Sash, with um, sorry with Susan Taff Reed, um, I contacted my college. I contacted the proctor and the dean, and what they told me was that yeah. they were unable to ask questions to confirm someone's tribal identity because it was against the law. Right, against but they don't have to ask any questions. You can just present them with the data. Yeah, the Equal Employment Opportunity Act. But the Equal Employment Opportunity Act has an Indian exception because we're a political identity. We're not a racial identity. Did you say so that to them? We did, but they just ignore it. Okay. So so I'm trying I'm, – I'm, I'm again, I'm going to press you on this because – this is so insane I know. that I know that people are going to be listening to this and they're going to be saying, I don't believe these two people. And we, this is the first time we've met, right? Yeah. So we're not in like any kind of conspiracy here. No. I'm just trying to give you a voice about a story that I think is incredibly important about a kind of corruption that has taken hold. And just to be even more clear about this, you gave an example. I can't remember the name of the person you met in California, but correct me if I'm wrong. Is something in Portland going on right now where there yeah. are pretendians? And could you please spend a few minutes talking about the university and who's pretending? So, so these, um, so there are two pretendians at UC Riverside. The other one is um, she's actually no, in um, Portland. In Portland. Well, I just want to mention oh. this really fast before we, but um, she's actually um, her name is um, oh god, I'm forgetting her name now. Um, 
her name is um, Allison Hedgecoke, and she's a she's a shortlist or long listed for the National Book Award this year, and so she makes two hundred twenty five thousand dollars a year at UC Riverside, and Andrea Smith makes she's makes she made one hundred forty thousand in twenty nineteen, plus she got forty thousand dollars reimbursement for travel expenses, so she's being paid forty thousand to travel around the world, saying she's a Cherokee woman, right? And so here at Portland State, and, and so these are not like these aren't the adjunct positions where they're making you know McDonald's restaurant money. These are these are real six-figure salary positions, and so which you know for an impoverished community like Native people is really important. You know, yeah, when sure. a member of our family gets their PhD and goes out there and wants to get a position, they have to go up against pretendians, and then also the pretendians try to push them out. You know, because they they fear the they fear actual Native people, so they try to get them out of the department. So it hurts Native people. It marginalizes us further, right. and also impoverishes us further. So, so, so there's there's no question that this is demonstrably harmful. Yes, and there's also no question if you look at the inclusion and diversity statements that on their mission they're very explicit about. You know, help it. Well, yeah. If you so the problem with self identification, which the universities use, is that it doesn't account for fraud. Right, and um, and the extent of the fraud that we're seeing, but um, here locally at Portland Portland State University, yeah, let's talk they about have Portland the um, they have the Indigenous Nations um, faculty, right? That's what they call them, and out of them, the three um, the three senior faculty are all pretendians. Wait yeah. a minute. Wait. You, so wait a second. I just want to. I just. <laughs> Would you mind repeating that, please? Yeah, the three uh, the three uh, senior faculty at Portland State, uh, the Indigenous Nations faculty, they're all pretendians. And we have uh, they're all pretending yes, to be Indians. Yeah, Grace Dillon, she's a fake Ojibwe woman. She claims to be Ojibwe Metis. She created the Indigenous Futurisms sort of tagline, which she ripped off, I guess, from you know Black Futurism. And um, her family have no native ancestry at all. No native ancestry. Their only connection to people of color is they used to own W. E. B. Du Bois's family. Uh, oh, geez. yeah. The B in W is Burkhart, which is her her um, ancestors who lived in New York. So State. she's a fraud at Portland State. Yes, and then and there she's is... in the native. Oh, can someone get the dog? Yeah. Sorry. Hi there. Okay, so please. Yeah, so getting back to Portland State, um, so I mentioned we had Grace Dillon, uh, yeah. and then the other one is um, a man named Ted Van Alst, and he is the head of department. He used to be- head He's the head of the department yes, and, at Portland well, State. I think he's now been kind of switched over to a slightly different title, but okay. and before he came from Yale, uh, he, ran the, he, he ran the Native Studies program at Yale oh. before that, and he claimed Lakota- you know, and, uh, and then um, now he's switched to like some sort of um, uh, kind of a fake Ojibwe tribe in Michigan. And his, but his daughter, we have, these are, this is intergenerational. So his okay. daughter's already getting her PhD as a, as a Lakota woman. Yeah. Wow. So the question is now that because we did this tree, we proved that he has no Lakota ancestry whatsoever. What's right? we know none. that that's a fact. Yes, none at all. And um, and so so now here he's switching, right? Uh, he's making moves. He's joined some kind of fake tribe in Michigan. You know, when you just pay five dollars to when you're in, you know, type of thing. And uh, so um, and then, but his daughter is still like pursuing a full blown Lakota sort of, a, you know, a Lakota woman. I'm an anthropologist, I'm a Lakota woman, and she's in her PhD program now, and I don't know if she's ever going to switch over to what the tribe her dad is now. I mean, it's, it's shocking when the kids who are born into it continue to fight yeah. for the fake identity. Who's the third fraud at Portland State? So the third fraud is Judy Blue Horse Skelton, okay. who claims to be Nez Perce and other things, and we did her tree and no Native ancestry. No Native ancestry. No Native ancestry. And we so, know this. Yeah, so we all, this. yeah, we, we went, we built their trees out, we looked at the lives of all of their ancestors, and we were able to also trace their ancestors back to Europe. And, um, and of course, we built out the trees to include their uh, non-direct ancestors and see if any of them were identifying as Indian. So what you know, when you build a tree out to like 4,000 people, you keep looking to see, well, is someone identifying as Indian? You know, I mean, you know, and like I mentioned, like that one ancestor may have decided, I'm not going to go on the trail of tears. I'm going to stay here with my white, you know, in-laws and goodbye. You guys head on out. Hopefully you survive. Okay. <laughs> It'd be like as if you were Jewish and you decide not to go to Auschwitz and right. send your family ahead of you, you know, and hang out with your Nazi in-laws. It's sort of like that. You're staying behind. They also, when they stayed behind, they also had to... Um, basically give up their native uh, okay. citizenship. But yeah, so okay. so it's so, just not, so, we just keep finding more white people. Okay, so we know 
at do the administration in Portland State know that they have? Because I've seen you tweet at them. I've I think I've seen other people tweet at them. I think yeah, they you've um, been contacted them. Yeah, so we have. I have emailed them. I emailed the um, president and the deans. So you have emailed the deans yes, at I, Portland over, State University, over a year and, a half and you ago emailed the presidents. The, and what the, what was the response to them? The very same people, just to be completely clear, who alleged to be pro, you know, social social justice, downtrodden, Native American rights, equity. What was the response? There was no response. Yeah. Um, and I think, but Imagine when we that. when we do talk to them, their main issue is like, well, it's it's so complicated being Indian. There's no way we can figure it out. But that's not true. We know that's no, not true. that is not true. And um, they they choose to believe it. I, you know, I, and this is where we I almost wonder. wonder if this is a racketeering situation That's where, um, you know, whereby, you know, they're sort of, they just trying to fill yep. certain things. Like when, like when we're looking, I'm working, looking at it in Hollywood as well. You know, I did the piece on Satching Little Feather. Right. We had another person, um, Heather Ray Bybee, who was the preeminent Cherokee filmmaker and she ran Sundance's native program. She is also pretending, like completely white. And um, and that story broke, oh, but okay, what, so one of the issues that we think is driving this is the, um, you know, I, I contacted SAG AFTRA, uh, you know, the union for the right. you know actors union to find how many native people they had, you know, that they could account for, and because uh, in 1989 an article came out and SAG gave a number like 170 native actors out of 77,000 members in 1989. Well, I asked them this time, and they, they didn't have a number anymore. Okay. And but the thing is that that low number tells you that it's really hard to to meet the demand. So what they tend to do, and and we, it, what's going on in California is California is giving them a tax break. The state is giving the, these productions a tax break if they have twenty percent people of color on the production. So what's the easiest way to turn people into is people? put a white person on there and claim they're a person of color. Yes. And so they, it almost they almost have to pay no taxes, no state taxes. Like they're frauds. Yes. They're and committing so, fraud. Yeah. And so this is I think part of it is this pressure is to sort of get these sorts of, you know, um, you know and, and with the funding, I mean Okay, you know, hold on. Let yeah. me, let me just, so let, let's let's bring it back to this case. So we know there's fraud at Portland State University, we know that the people deeply involved, and again, as you said, these are not adjuncts. Mm -hmm. These are, what are they, full, they're, they yeah, have I mean, tenure? These they are have people tenure. making around 200000 a, a lot year. of money, so yeah. that's, okay. You've contacted the administration, and they've said it's complicated, mm -hmm. but the fact of the matter is, I've been sitting, how long have I been sitting here? Half an hour? It, simply... I, I, I did my research beforehand, or more accurately, someone else did the research for me, and I read it. This is not particularly complicated to figure out who's native and who's not. No, and, and the thing is, they're trying to, like, say, oh, people are hiding the whole, all those ridiculous stories. And, um, and yet, you know, we, we present them with 4,000 people all identifying as white. Do you know what I mean? Even their distant cousins. Like, nobody is identifying as Indian, you know? But, the, but uh, by sheer coincidence, the people who are identified as Indian are in academic positions, in Native Studies or First Nations or what have you programs, gaining a lot of money, they've taken advantage of the system, let's call it for what it is, this is fraudulent behavior. Yep, it's fraud. And the administration does nothing. Yep. They, they, they do nothing. Yeah, they're they, complicit in fraud. Well, because they are publishing these claims, unverified claims, in um, front-facing sort of um, places like on the web, on their website, you know, in the in, in, in their bios, on, I mean, they are promoting fraud, and, and so there is one law, which is the uh, American Indian Arts and Crafts Act, which was um, passed in the 30s as a sort of truth in advertising law, right? And um, and really, what we are talking about is marketing here. We're not talking about someone's actual identity. You know, um, when I um, one of the things I often point out is that there's this idea: the minute you find out you're Indian, you're supposed to make make money off of it. Do you know what I mean? And um, and I, you know, I have fifty four first cousins. Like I'm not joking, first cousins. And I have three siblings. So there's like fifty eight of us, right? Wow, We're all that's enrolled impressive. in federally recognized tribes. Okay. Right. All of my cousins are. Um, but out of all of us, only myself. And one other cousin who was a state legislator, we're the only ones that mention our tribal identity as part of our professional life. Two out of 58 people. 
you know. And, you know, my, my mother-in-law is, you know, Mohawk and Seneca. Her family don't do it. My dad's family don't. I mean, it's just, so, it, it's, it's not like, okay. it's just not, it's just not normal to, to basically capitalistically approach your identity as a marketing business. And that's what we're targeting is the way in which they market themselves as native and they mark and they, and they capitalize on our trauma, right? To build their careers and their influence. And then, and then the people who allege to protect you are complicit in the corruption. Yeah, they're not doing anything. Yeah, we they and they act like it's it's too complicated. You know, native identity is too complicated is their whole answer. But I mean, you know, fraud is not complicated. Do you know what I mean? They're trying to say, oh, blood quantum's evil and bad. We're not gonna look at blood quantum. Well these people have no blood to measure. There's blood quantum's not their issue, you know, because they have no blood. Right. So it's just it's pretty simple, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I think that so their arguments, they seem convincing, but they're not when they're you seem, look at them. They seem convincing to somebody who knows literally nothing about it. But that happens to not be you. You know a lot about this. In fact. OK, so let me ask you. A question. So we've named names, which is exactly what I want to do. Mm -hmm. If somebody commits a fraud and they're complicit in corruption, they should be exposed. Are you afraid that the people we've named when this video comes out are going to sue you for saying that they're pretendians? Well, the thing is, if they took me to court, um, first of all, I'd be able to do discovery on them. And secondly... Um, and make you know, that public. Yeah. And secondly, they um, they would have to prove to the judge that they are Native. Yeah. I mean, um, cause yeah. otherwise there's no defamations taking place. I mean, so if they can't prove they're Native, they have no case. And so, and it, if, and if, yeah, and if, um, you know, and if they, if I can get discovery on them, I can find out like, well, how much money have they gotten through their claims? Oh my God, that is. Unreal. They don't want me reaching into their bank accounts. Oh my God, this is I mean? so awesome. So, okay. yeah. So they, the very fact that they would not take you to court for outing them means almost by definition, that they are pretending, yeah. that they are pretending to be Indians or else they take you to court. But they don't take you to court because you have the right of discovery and you could reveal the fact that these people are complete frauds. Yeah, and also we want to know how much money have they actually gotten. I mean, we have their salaries, we have... We're and trying they would to, have to give we're, it we're, back. We're trying to track... I hope. Well, I don't think they would, but they would have to... Because, of course, the, the universities all claim, well, we don't hire based on race. Well, that's you know I mean? totally... And so... Completely. Yeah, I mean, and, diverse, that's just... Yeah, I mean, like lie. I mentioned... I mentioned the um, University of Kansas right now has three pretendians working there, okay. right? And one of them is totally obvious. Like he's claiming his 100% Polish mo grand mother was um, was a 100% um, Comanche, right? Totally easy because you know her parents are born in Poland, right? And um, so, and his family are from Pennsylvania, never been anywhere near Comanche. And what's his name? His name is Ray Pirati. Okay. And so he, and even his own family wrote to the university, wrote to KU and said, we are not Comanche. You know, my, his mother died and on her deathbed, she, she begged her family to tell the university that her mother was a proud Polish woman, that she was not Comanche. And so, and, and the then, so the university, just they, to be clear, the it. universities know this. They this know is, this, this was, this, know this, this letter was written to them 10 years ago. Okay. And then the, then the Comanche nation wrote to them and told them that Ray Pirati was not native, was not Comanche and they ignored him. And so, um, and, and, and is he a professor? He's still there. He's yeah. still there he's as still a professor. There. Yes, he's still there. He even tried to sue them, um, under the, um, diversity equity stuff, but then when they took him to court, he couldn't prove he was native, so he lost in court already. So he's lost in court. He his family and denounced he's, and him. And he's still there. And yes, he's okay, still there. So let me let me ask you a question. And then Ken Blancet was there as a he got hired as a Langston Hughes professor, which is a professorship at KU meant to bring minority voices to campus. And oh, they but hired a white man. They 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 hired. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So right. yeah, it's just so not checking is not working. Do you know what I mean? And I think um, a study mm -hmm. came it, out. It's more than not working. It's com it's complicit in fraud. Yes, and well, I mean, you know, the thing is with, and this whole thing of self identification is also being done by the U.S. Census, mm -hmm. right? Which means that we can't pull out really good data on how Native people are doing because we have all these people who are claiming. And um, I did a piece actually in 2016 in the Nation where I took on the Washington Post for running that. They did a um, a Redskins poll, like they were polling for racism. And I looked at the data and everything, and you can read the whole study I wrote. But basically, they were relying on self identification on the phone, and so you get like this these weird results, like with this like huge numbers of people from um, Arkansas where there aren't many Native people, men over the age of 50. Okay. You know, which, you know, most Native men are dead by then. It's not, you're not going to get a poll where 
80% of the respondents are native, so, native so, are, are over 50. Okay, so let me ask you a question. You don't have to answer this if this is too personal a question. I know that people are going to be watching this and they're going to be saying, this woman, this woman is a right wing maniac. <laughs> are you, are you, are, are you, no. on, no. you're not on the right. You're not a no. right wing MAGA. I no, mean, no, you're, no, you're not at all. So you're not a right wing. So when, have you gone to, to the left wing with this stuff? Well, you know, we, um, we have, I mean, we basically put the information out there, you know, and, um, you know, and I, I, published things in you know outlets like the San Francisco Chronicle and other outlets and um, but I do think that there's a lot of resistance and among and so who the left or the, the right I think well you know of course I have mentioned a few articles the New York Times have done on the issue both um, working with pretendians and also revealing pretendians um, they also did one on Governor Stitt as well who is a Cherokee citizen but bought, his family bought their way onto the rolls so he's not Cherokee by blood and um, but um, but yeah, but I think uh, it's been really hard to get that kind of consistent coverage of of a lot of corruption in Indian country. Um, and uh, and the problem is that when like an outlet like the New York Post jumps on it, right, it's so right. easy for the left to dismiss it as simply an attack on Native people generally that it doesn't it doesn't uh, but, at all have any effect. But it's not an attack on Native people. It's an attack on white people pretending to be Native I people. I know, exactly. And that's the thing is like uh, these... Um, we have like white people who are pretending to be native um, and they, they basically weaponize, um, they try to say that, I don't know, they're weaponizing racism, like claiming that we're being racist against them. I had one professor tell me how- Wait, wait a second. Wait, what? Yes. Yeah. So one, <laughs> I, yeah, I had, I had a native professor tell me once how um, he uh, just asking a pretending like, so, you know, cause normally when you meet other native people from your community, you want to know who's your family, like where you not, you're not asking in a, in a threatening way. You're asking in a way you want to kind of, you know, enjoy being the, from the same community. The bond. Yeah. Like who's your family. Then you immediately build a picture, how you're related and how your families are related. Well, when you ask a pretending in this, it's incredibly intimidating to them. And they react because really, they're pretending. Yes, because they're pretending. They don't have any relatives, um, and so they. Uh, so this. So he asked a pretending in this, and the pretending went to the dean and told the dean, and the dean told the native professor, the actual native professor, told them, "You are racist because uh, this person looks white, and therefore you will never lead the native studies department at this university because you're racist." Can you share the name of the university? I, I can't do that right now, okay. but yeah, but it's just uh, an example of sort of how. You know, natives, na actual native people, are marginalized totally. in the situation, and threaten their careers are threatened. But, but what's limited. really interesting to me, Shida, and what's really interesting to me, it's not just that they're marginalized and threatened; they're marginalized and threatened again by the very people who are screaming at the rooftops that they're standing up for native rights. That's the crazy. I mean, if they were marginalized by the KKK, that would be one thing. Yeah. But they're marginalized by the very people who are at least verbally and on paper, they look like they're they're bending over. They're, it, it's the craziest thing. Okay, so you're not worried about being sued. We have this, I don't know how many people make an epidemic, but this is a lot of people pretending. We've You've contacted the administration. I assume other people, you can't be the, 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 the single person. Other people have con contacted them. They say it's, it's too complicated, et cetera. So I'm gonna ask you a question. If you don't feel comfortable asking answering this question, don't feel this answer this question because it could be beyond your purview. But it seems to me, I'll give you my opinion and then you can comment on that. Maybe that's easier. It seems to me that look, it's obvious that if you have been pretending to be an, an Indian and you have got gotten to whatever you have been in your position, Native American studies, it's to, it's another level of dishonesty to claim that. By claiming that you have Native American blood, that didn't have anything to do with you getting the position, especially when you look at the statements to who gets in. So obviously those people are committing fraud. Obviously there should be consequences. In my opinion, there should be legal consequences, but we'll, mm -hmm. we'll bracket that. But weigh in on this. Shouldn't there be consequences to the institutions that harbor known frauds? I think there should be. I mean, um, 
consequences is, is, is part of what we're trying to, you know, through providing information, try to, you know, maybe obtain. I think um, immense damage has been done to Native people for decades now. Um, careers long, have been destroyed. That, right? Yeah. Oh. And, um, and, you know, I, um, we, I was took part in this conference uh, last year, uh, call in March and April of last year at Michigan State University, which they called unsettling genealogies, right? You know, settler genealogies, unsettling, yeah, kind yeah. of a funny. And um, and one of the folks, one of the first folks who spoke was an elderly gentleman from a tribe in Michigan. And you have to understand these land grant institutions have a particular responsibility to the tribes whose land they occupy, right? It's their lands that are under occupation, right? And so, um, and these, so these land grant institutions have a specific responsibility. Sometimes it's even explicitly stated in their charter, right? And um, so what happens is often they will try to rename or rebadge a Native Studies Department as the Indigenous Studies Department, thereby opening it up to people who are Indigenous to anywhere in the world, oh, which is basically all humanity. I mean, we're all Indigenous to somewhere. <laughs> it's just a completely nonsense word um, in this context. And, um, and so what he was describing was how as an undergraduate in the late 60s, he's an elder now, um, he and other undergraduates fought to get a Native Studies Department in Michigan and state. And then it went well while they had actual Native people running it. And then it got taken over. Once there's money, once there's like a big salary on the line, that's when the pretendians come in. Do you know what I mean? And they grab that. And so he was saying how they now, now Michigan State was being, at that point, was still being run by a pretendian, right? The Native Studies, the Indig he, he, he renamed the Indigenous Studies Department. And basically Michigan tribes were completely cut out. But let me ask you, let me ask you a question. I am so truly energized by this deranged issue. Have you ever thought about suing these people? I would totally go in and my nonprofit would help you fund a suit against these people. Well, I think that um, we would love a suit. I mean, I think because like there's a lot of information we Let's can get Let's file a suit against Portland way. State. What we really are looking for is to basically get accountability. Uh, we are looking at some legal um, sort of... Uh, pursuits. One is actually amending the Indian Arts and Crafts Act. It was amended in 1990. It's under uh, review right now, again, um, both by the um, Department of the Interior and also uh, by, um, by in the Senate, the U.S. Senate. And so we're looking at that process of expanding the law to, right now the law, like I said, it is a truth and advertising law, right? And so it basically looks at arts and crafts. Right. And uh, but we want it to also include authorship and performing arts as well. And so we could expand the law. And that law has some pretty, um, pretty strong, um, you know, I think you get like um, you can get up to uh, I'm not sure, like a hundred thousand dollar fine and five years in prison for pretending to be Indian and selling artwork, you know. So and imagine what, what you could do pretending to be Indian and teaching people at a university while pretending to be Indian. I mean, there's, they don't, they have their salaries. They also get access to huge amounts of grants. I mean, the Mellon Foundation has been giving out $5 million grants. You know, I mean, there's a lot of money that they grab at. And of course, they're in charge of um, one I of mean, the, they're in charge of all I mean, these. This is uh, truly monstrous. They're, they're, they're in charge of generations of Native American studies students. And, and they, like a lot of the research <laughs> we're doing with, as far as tracking fraud, they would, it would never be approved at the departmental level. You know, there's no way they can do this research in the universities. And so, you know, a lot of the claims... So just, let's, yeah. let's just, I, wanna, I, wanted, I just want to drill down on this. So just to be completely clear, there are white people who are pretending to be Indians yeah. who have gotten large sums of money yeah. to direct Native American studies programs. Yeah. And, and grants and fellowships. And grants and fellowships who are frauds. Yes. And... We know they're frauds. Yeah. They know that we know they're frauds. Yes. They know that we know that they know that they're frauds. Yes. And they do nothing. Well, they, yeah, they continue to fight it. And this is where we think that this is some sort of... No, the universities do nothing. The, yeah, the universities do nothing. And um, and the pretendians continue to aggressively fight for their space. And so you um, you have them trying to find other ways to claim, like through purchasing. And like, state-recognized tribes have no sort of... Um, there, there's no standard way in which they are recognized. So sometimes they can be recognized just because some state legislator likes them, do you know what I mean? So there's no standard they've met. Some of them are just literally 
they're fake tribes. Do you know what I mean? And so they will seek to join one of those to wow, get around the law. fake tribes. Yeah, and that's another thing they're trying to amend in the Indian Arts and Crafts Act is to get rid of state recognition. Wow, they're you know. just fake. I well, mean, the I mean, whole, that's another layer of deception. It's yeah, like a, it's it's the huge. layers of fakery and corruption. Well, the, the L.A. Times did a piece a couple of years ago. They found that over um, something like two hundred and fifty million dollars in federal funds were taken by fake tribes, and. Um, for, for funds, just to be completely clear, they could go to people who actually yes. need yeah. it, who and are suffering. I think it went even, I talked to the reporter later, um, like last fall, in September, and apparently that number, they kept doing that, even after they published the article, I think in 2019, they kept doing the math, and it went to over a billion dollars. So a lot of money is taken in by frauds, and um, and both as state fake tribes. I'm doing a series of articles, and one of them is looking at NOAA, you know, the federal agency, which is looking at doing a um, co-management of a marine sanctuary off the coast of California, and they're doing it with a fake tribe. Yeah, I wrote, one of my first books was about Bears Ears and how that's a co-management proposal brought forward by five real tribes, you know, in the Southwest. And um, and here you have Noah so excited uh, to be doing something similar, but doing it with a fake tribe. Yeah, a tribe that was proven in court not to be real. And so, so yeah, so it's just um, they're just it's hard because we're so outnumbered. I mean. The, um, that study I mentioned, that Kellogg well, Foundation study. I'm going to give study, you a voice, I promise. Thank you. Yeah, the Kellogg Foundation study I mentioned in 2017 found that um, they found that 30% of white Americans think that they have Native ancestry. That's over, it's close to 80 million, like 78 million people. Yeah. I mean, I was being interviewed by uh, the CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting and um, and I told them it's like double the population, the entire population of Canada, you know. And so, you know, it's just like, and then, you know, of course, there's a lot of other people who want to be Indian. You know, I mean, it's just, you know, of course, there's a huge move um, through the sort of indigenismo sort of movement um, of uh, Latinx folks to be Indian. So I have no problem with people who glorify or want to be, but that's totally different from fraud. Yes. Yes, it is. You're right. It is different. And and that's the difference between pretendianism and wannabeism. Right. right? You know, and, you, and I assume you have no problem with wannabeism. I mean, if someone yeah. wants to be an Indian, well, I mean, I want to be rich. Yeah. You can want to be yeah, anything I, you as want that doesn't not, make you rich. Yeah. As long as they're not like, you know, putting it on the resume. Yeah. Well, that well, no, but that's the line. That's pretending. Yes. So that you cross the line from wanting to be to pretending. Yes. And then also, you know, the whole thing of... um the sort of really aggressive um, way in which they act um, against Native people in the workforce. Yeah, so that's the other component that we haven't discussed. Yeah. But this, again, this is so insane. Like, I cannot believe that this is not a major, major news story. And to me, I don't know how familiar you are with my work, but this just speaks... So we expose, my nonprofit exposes corruption, National mm -hmm. Progress Alliance, wherever it's found. One of the main sources of corruption right now is the universities. And this is such a conspicuous example of it. Yeah. So I, I, I just, what do you want people to know who listen to this video? Like, what do you want people to understand either how it's hurt your community, something about pretendians in any domain or arena, anything you want? What do you want people to know? So I guess the main thing is that Native people, and, and I wrote a whole piece in the San Francisco Chronicle in November where I talked about what is an Indian. And so you can read that if you want to get a lot of detailed information about this. And um, you can check out my muckrack um, profile and it has all my articles there. But um, but yeah, they. Um, I think the main thing is that Native people are not a race, right? You can, we can be of any perceived race. But what we are, are we are citizens of nations, nations that pre-existed the United States, nations whose lands are presently under occupation by the United States, and, and that we have issues that we want to talk to the United States government about, which no one else has standing to do so. Like what, what issues? Quick. Regarding our lands, our homelands, our, our, you know, our right to exist on them. You know, uh, we are the only ones whose land is under occupation by the most powerful country in the world. Us, only us, no one else. I mean, and so we have issues that we want to talk about, that we want to deal with, and we don't want people in the way who are simply play acting the role for their own benefit. And uh, and we really need Americans to, if you really want to go beyond, 
you know, land recognition, you know, land acknowledgement statements, then recognize our sovereignty as nations and our continued existence and persistence. You know, I mentioned that my the Navajo Nation is the size of Ireland, has the population of Iceland, is larger than 18 member states of the United Nations. You know, we're a country within the United States. I mean, if Iceland was in the middle of the United States and no one knew it was there, that's our situation, right? So we want that recognition of our continued persistent political existence. And um, and so pretendianism is a way of continuing to ignore that for some sort of self-gain and the sort of, um, you know, the sort of capitalistic, the, the relationship is capitalistic. It's not it's not through kinship, through our own traditions. And, um, and so it's completely, it's just a form, another form of capitalism. I, this is just, there's just, there's just so much here. I, I, I just want to really thank you for exposing these people and exposing the corruption and exposing the fraud and exposing the rot. And one of the things that I want to do is I want to give you a platform and I want to connect you with other people who can get the story out. And I think that these individuals should be accountable for what they've done. I think that the institutions that have employed these individuals after they've known that they are frauds should be completely held accountable for this. Um, and so I genuinely thank you for your works. Like totally yeah. thank you. Thank you. And we'd like for people to write letters to let them know. I think the more they hear from, particularly because a lot of the donors donated money because they wanted to help American to, to, Indians. Yes. And instead it's going to these other groups, you yeah. know, and, um, and, and then, I want, I'm sorry, I want yeah. to just comment on that. So yeah. one, one of the things that we do is we have a don't donate campaign, which uh -huh. is literally the easiest ask in the world. We're asking people not to donate to their alma maters. Don't donate because these places are cesspools of rot, filth and corruption. We'd like to see, you know, I mean, it's just, uh, I mean, I can't even, you know, I went to Dartmouth College and, you know, going there as a, as a teenager and then finding out like which people there now, now know who the frauds were. The total, for, total frauds. And I feel like, yeah, yeah. I feel like I was, you know, I mean, I was 17, 18 years old. I was, had people play acting my experience to me. That's a form of abuse, you know, and, um, and, 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 you know, even now, you know, they're, uh, they, they're not happy with the work I'm doing. So it's not like Dharma well, sure, is that's because they, ever going to... The fraud doesn't like it exposed when they're exposed as yeah, a fraud. Yeah, it's all about, you know, and then, of course, we have defendians, which are Native people who defend fraudsters. <laughs> yeah, which is very strange. And um, Why do they, at the risk of long, making yeah. the interview longer, why why would they defend pretend Indians? Um, well, I, some of it's just personal gain, that what they get from the relationship. You know, I think, um, you know, what can another Indian give them? you know, accept competition. So they'd rather go throw in their lot with a pretendian who can help them up the the whole thing, you know. And uh End of Empire. Yeah. End, yeah. Of, end of Empire. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, Jacqueline. Thank you. Yeah. Really appreciate it.